I'm going to ask you to turn with me in the Word today, if you would, to uh, John chapter number 3, the Gospel of John chapter number 3, and I will meet you there in just a moment. Um, you may notice some familiar faces returning back. We've got some, co- some of our own college students have gone off to college, but in the process, there's a lot of college kids that go to college in Dallas area colleges that become a part of North Place while they're in college, and uh, there are some of them here today, and I do want to say welcome to the Williams family. Kendrick is, mom and dad came to move Kendrick back into school this weekend, and Pops got the whole family here on the front row, so glad to see you back, Kendrick, and uh, Glad you got the whole family with you, so you'll be seeing more of Kendrick in the days ahead as he gets connected back to school. Last weekend, I began a conversation about culture. Culture is the unseen, intangible things that make up the ethos, the environment, the experience of a place, a person, or an organization. Every restaurant has a distinct culture. Every school has a distinct culture. Every church, every home, every life has a distinct culture. We said the easiest way to define culture is the way we do things here. The way you conduct your life, the culture of your life, the way you do things in your home, different from anybody else's home. The way we do things in this church is different and unique from other churches. The culture is the way we do things here. It's the unwritten but understood and agreed upon way things work in your family, an office, or your own life for that matter. But the importance of culture is often overlooked because the things that make up culture are intangible. The things that make up the culture of your life or the things that make up the culture of the organizations that you're a part of, it's all under the surface, unseen stuff. So we often ignore culture. And when we ignore culture, we ignore it at our own peril. Because here's what we said last week. Culture is the foundation of vision. I don't care how beautifully crafted your life's purpose statement and vision statement are. You could have gone to a Tony Robbins conference. You could have gone to some other self-help Zig Ziglar. Anybody, you could have gone to a conference over a weekend, and they could have helped you craft the most beautiful vision statement, uh, the most powerful vision statement for your life. You may carry it around in your pocket. You may hang it on the wall. It doesn't matter how articulate the vision statement for your life is. If the culture of your life is toxic, and unhealthy, your vision will never flourish. The culture of a church is the foundation. The culture of a life is the foundation on which the vision is established. At the end of September, early October, I'll be unveiling the most aggressive vision initiative in the history of our church. It's a five-year initiative, and we pray that in that window of time, we make as much of an impact on the kingdom of God as we have in the previous 100, that we go from being one local church to literally becoming a movement impacting the globe. That's why it's so important for us to have this culture conversation now, for you to understand the vision we're going to be talking about in a few weeks, for it to make sense You have to grasp the culture. We have been intentional about creating, cultivating, and contending for a gospel-centered, Christ-honoring culture here. And it is the foundation of our vision. So today and next weekend, I'm going to move from the big picture conversation about culture. And I'm going to get into the specifics, some of the key ingredients that make up the North Place culture, that make us unique, that make us different from the church down the road. It's the unseen things in the soil that make us who we are as a people. And one of those key ingredients in our culture is generosity. As a matter of fact, I believe that generosity is one of the most important in components or ingredients of the North Place culture. Let me explain generosity today by reading a verse that most of us can quote by heart. And for for some of us, that's the problem, is we can quote it by heart, and we've quoted it so much we haven't looked at the depth of what it's saying. So I'm going to intentionally read it today out of the New Living Translation because more than likely that's a version of Scripture you didn't memorize it in growing up. It's the same meaning, different wording, but I'm hoping the difference in the way you hear it today helps you hear and see a well-known verse in a fresh new way. John 3.16 says this, For this is how God loved the world. This is how He loved. He gave. This is what He gave. He gave His one and only Son. This is why He gave. So that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now listen to that first phrase. This is how God loved the world. He gave. This verse reveals the generous nature of our God. 
Just about everything you need to know about biblical generosity is housed in this one little verse. First, biblical generosity is the act of expressing love, for this is how God loved the world. Generosity is love expressed. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully today because some of you are already making a mistake. And if you make the mistake, I think some of you are, you're going to miss the whole point today. Some of us are already making the mistake. They hear the word generosity and they equate it to giving money. And generosity is so much more than giving money. I know people who give large amounts of money to charities, but at the core of the, who they are, they are not really generous people. I know some of them well. And I know the motivation of their giving is to make them feel better about themselves or the motivation of their giving is to get some kind of recognition in the process. So their networking or their charitable donations are simply a form of elevating their business identity in the community. So their giving is not really the fruit of some deep culture of generosity in their life. Their giving is literally all about them. They are their own motivation for giving. Real generosity is much deeper than dropping a check in the offering plate at church. It's much deeper than sending an end of the year gift at Christmas time to feed the homeless. Real generosity is a character trait. It's our nature or it's not. It's who we are or it's who we aren't. And if your life is marked by a culture of generosity, there's going to be a lot of different fruits that are born in your life that are the fruits of generosity. For example, Forgiveness is the fruit of generosity. If I am a genuinely generous person, I can give things to people that they don't deserve. And one of those things is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the byproduct of generosity. If you're having a hard time letting something go and forgiving something, you've got more than a forgiveness problem or an unforgiveness problem. You have a generosity problem. When you develop a culture of generosity in your life, you're able to give people things they don't deserve. Another fruit of generosity is hospitality. When you walk into a generous home or a generous church or any generous environment, you can sense the generosity of the place starting to bubble up in the warm and inviting hospitality of that place because generosity makes people feel at home when they are far from home. Hospitality is the fruit of generosity. Service is the fruit of generosity. Generosity will cause you to serve in a way that will put other people's needs above your own. Honor is the fruit of generosity. The way you do or don't honor older generations, your peers, or younger generations says a lot about whether or not you have a culture of generosity in your life. And we say it this way here. Generosity honors up, honors down, and honors all around. If you are a generous person, you will have a culture of honor in your life. If real biblical generosity is a part of a church culture, that generosity will be reflected in every area of the church, not just in the budget and in the finances. And you better know it. If a church has a culture of generosity, it's going to take care of the giving thing. The financial issues will take care of itself. But the financial issue, the giving component, is just one of the many fruits of generosity. Our Heavenly Father is generous to the core. Generosity is His DNA. It is His nature. Generosity is not something God practices being generous is not something on God's to-do list. God doesn't practice generosity. It's not something he does. Generosity is who he is. He is generous towards us in the love that he expresses towards us. Listen to that line in the verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave. Biblical generosity is the act of expressing love. And you can express love in a lot of ways. You can express love by forgiving, by honoring, by serving, by showing hospitality, and in the most obvious, by giving freely of the time, talent, and treasure that God has blessed your life with. And that leads to the second element of generosity that we find in John 3, 16. Biblical generosity is sacrificial generosity. He gave because of, he loved, because of his love. He loved us. But what did he give? What did he give? He gave his only begotten son or his one and only son that was sacrificial giving for something to be considered generous in the eyes of God and for something to be considered generous within the framework of scripture 
It has to be, gener- it has to be sacrificial generosity. It has to, it's going to cost you something. If it's going to be biblical generosity, it's going to cost you greatly. That's why the concept of forgiveness is a beautiful picture of biblical generosity. Because for you to forgive somebody that has wronged you, that has committed an injustice against you, means that you've got to humble yourself, you've got to swallow your pride, you've got to posture yourself in such a way that God is able to love people through you that you don't have the capacity to love. Forgiveness is an expression of selfless and sacrificial generosity. Now, most of you in the room today know that I was exploited as a child, sexually abused as a child. I had an abuser in my life. My father abandoned my family when I was young and walked out on my life, my mom, my family, my sister. And so I've grown up most of my life having to learn how to forgive two different men in my life, one who uh, raped me, another who walked out on me. And I can tell you it's been difficult learning how to forgive my father. But it was altogether a whole nother thing to learn how to forgive the man that sexually exploited me. I have to make that decision almost every single day. And I'm certain that my forgiveness of that journey has has helped those two men some way in their life. My father's already gone on to be with the Lord. But I, I have no doubt it freed them in some way. But the ultimate journey of my forgiveness over those men was not something that freed them. It transformed me. I don't have the capacity to forgive my abuser, but God did such a deep work of grace in my heart that there was an ability to do something supernatural. As I become more like Christ, I learn that I, he, he has given me so much that I don't deserve, and part of my journey is learning how to give the same grace away to people that I'll never trust the man that abused me, um, I, I, but I, I have learned to forgive him, and I didn't set him free. I set myself free. In the process. And that journey of forgiveness is this picture of what it looks like. You could never come to that place unless God begins to build a culture of generosity in your life. Now, listen, I've worked hard up to this point to get you to think of generosity in broader terms than what we normally think of. We normally think of generosity in the terms of financial things, and I want you to see it as so much more. But we would fail ourselves if we didn't examine generosity in its most obvious area. It's most obvious expression. Jesus talked about money and possessions more than he did almost anything else. Most people don't realize this. Jesus talked about money and possessions twice as much as he talked about faith and prayer in the Bible. Eleven of his 40 parables have to deal with money and possessions because the way we manage our money and possessions truly reveals the spiritual condition of our hearts. So in a conversation about generosity, we can't ignore the obvious. And I think the main reason Jesus measured the spiritual condition of the heart with the way that we handle our money is because it's a concrete way to measure. It's hard to measure hospitality. It's hard to measure forgiveness. It's it's hard to measure service. I know when they're there and when they're not. I know when I'm in a hospitable environment and in an inhospitable environment. I know when I've been served well and when I haven't. I know when I've been forgiven and when I haven't. I know when they're there and when they're not, but it's hard to measure them. But it's different when you start talking about money and possessions. They're easier to measure. A quick glance at your bank statements or your checking account will tell you who your God is or who your gods are. Your true priorities will be reflected in the way you manage your money. You can say you believe things or you can say you believe in certain things, but the way you manage your money will quickly tell you what you truly believe in. That's why Matthew 6, Jesus said this, verse 21, wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be. In other words, your money and possessions will follow your heart. That's why a quick glance of how you treat money will reflect the spiritual condition of your heart. God's love was expressed to us. His generosity, his love expressed was the costliest act of generosity you could ever imagine. He gave us his son. For something to be sacrificial, it has to be selfless. And the generosity you see modeled in John 3, 16 is both selfless and sacrificial. Now, I hinted to this a moment ago, but I want to drive it home, and I want to say it the same thing in different words. Listen, you can give money and not be a generous person, but you cannot be a biblically generous person and not be a giving person. It's not possible. You might ask, well, Pastor, how can that be? How how could a person be willing to give money away and not really be generous? The key is in the motivation. There's a counterfeit generosity. Something I would call a narcissistic generosity. A generosity that is self-serving. 
people that are giving only to get something back in return. And when that's your motivation, you're not really giving anything to anybody. You're ultimately giving to yourself. Cultural expert Jim Gilmore made up his own word to explain this epidemic in our culture. His word is narcissistropy. And it's the combination of narcissism and philanthropy to describe a prevalent reality in our culture. It's everywhere. Matter of fact, there's a cult, there's an organization right now that has a commercial that plays on occasion called I Participate. And the tagline for I Participate is this, improve your health by helping others. Gwyneth Paltrow, a popular actress, is one of the spokespeople for I Participate, and in one of their commercials, let me quote you exactly what she says about why people ought to get involved in I Participate. Doing good for others, doing positive action, always comes back around and enriches your life. It's the biggest gift you could ever give yourself. This is an invitation to help other people. This is an invitation to use your resources to help other people. But what is the ultimate motivation? Your own gain. She said it is the biggest gift you could ever give yourself. The primary motivation of biblical generosity is never you or a gift given to yourself. Biblical generosity that the Father modeled for us and biblical generosity that the Father expects from us is a selfless and sacrificial generosity. Our motivation should always be His honor and serving others. It's about Him and them and never about us. Of course, I participate. Gwyneth Paltrow, their statement is a great tagline. It markets well. It's going to motivate people that wouldn't have otherwise been motivated because the American culture is motivated by a lot of self-serving things. It sounds good that to ears that are not trained by the Spirit of God. But at the end of the day, it's narcissism, not generosity. It's counterfeit generosity that is more self-serving than it is sacrificial. Now, that's, that's a nonprofit out there somewhere. Let me move from a nonprofit out there somewhere to bring it right in here into the church. There is a version of the gospel being proposed in the church, it's been around forever, known as the prosperity gospel, and it's a a wretched curse on the church as far as I'm concerned, because the prosperity gospel teaches Christians that your motivation for giving is because of what you're going to get back. You give so that you will be blessed. Does the scripture teach that God blesses generous people? Yes, for sure. But what's the motivation of your heart in your giving? Is the motivation to honor God and to help bring people into relationships? relationship with him or is your motivation simply to be blessed it all comes back to the motivation of your heart one is real generosity that is going to be blessed one is narcissism and it's being taught in pulpits Amen. proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says this one person gives freely yet gains even more another withholds unduly unduly but comes to poverty a generous person will prosper Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. It's true. But the key is motivation. Is your ultimate motivation your own refreshing? Is that why you're serving other people? Is that why you're giving to the church? Is that why you're serving the poor for the ultimate motivation of your own refreshing? Or is your ultimate motivation his glory and those people? God's promise to us is this. If your ultimate goal is his glory and serving others, you can't help but be refreshed. But if your ultimate goal is you, then you're not practicing biblical, sacrificial, selfless generosity. Now think about it in terms of hospitality. Let's go back to the hospitality conversation. Some of you may be having get-togethers over at your house tomorrow. And I know that whenever we have get-togethers at our house, my to-do list grows. My honey-do list grows. I'm mowing and pulling weeds and we're getting the house clean and all that cheap stuff we eat off of goes up and the better stuff comes out. That's the way it happens, you know, when guests come over. The question we have to ask ourselves is this, what is the motivation of our hospitality? Are we pulling weeds and edging the lawn and putting the cheap stuff up and getting the china out because we're trying to manage an image and we want to be thought well of by our guests? Or is the reason we're doing all of that is because we want to serve them well. And we want to give them the best we possibly have to offer. I would say a lot of times our hospitality is motivated by our image management. And if that's the case, our hospitality is not serving anybody but us. 
If our motivation for sweating in the lawn and cleaning the flower bed and putting the chief stuff up and getting the best stuff out is because we genuinely want to love on people well and we want to serve them well, it's hospitality. One of those is biblical selfless sacrificial generosity and one is narcissism. They're both framed as hospitality. One serves you, one serves people. In Mark 12, Jesus really drove this idea home. It says this, Jesus, verse 41, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts, then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. And I'll notice verse 43, Jesus is basically huddling up his disciples while all this is, this is not a parable, it's an actual event. And he pulls them out of the crowd and just says, watch this. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Now in these verses, Jesus is teaching on a whole lot more than giving principles. He's teaching his disciples what it looks like when somebody has fostered, developed, cultivated a culture of generosity in their life. There are two types of people in this passage, and each of them have radically different views on generosity. There are rich people who are giving large sums of money. They are people of importance and honor. Their large offerings are noticed by everybody that's there, and they are giving from their excess their surplus. Not, not, I mean, this is something they can do easily. It's larger than the widow, but there is nothing sacrificial about this. It's for show, and it's from the surplus. Because their giving was seen and it was noticed, they were being honored by men as great donors, great philanthropists, and great benefactors. Now, the other type of person in this story is the widow. And her her reality, her culture, she really was a non-person. She had no individual identity in her own society without connection to a male in her life, her husband or her sons. And we know that by her title in this story, a widow, her social and economic standing would have first come through her husband, but we know she didn't have a husband, she's called a widow, so then it would have come through her sons, but the reference to her extreme poverty leads us to believe that she didn't have a son either. She had no male provider, leaving her socially and economically disadvantaged, but her actions show her to be humble and faithful. Her generosity is selfless and sacrificial. She gave everything she had to live on, Jesus said, which shows an incredible degree of trust in the Father's ability to care for her after this moment. In contrast to what the disciples or the people would have been thinking that day, Jesus didn't honor the people that gave the most money. Jesus honored the one whose heart was in the right place. He honors the widow lifts her up as an example to be followed because biblical generosity is the result of a transformed heart and mind. Now, I also want you to notice this. Jesus doesn't romanticize the small gift and he doesn't strike out against the large gift. He measures all generosity by the same standard for everybody. And here's what he's asking. Is it sacrificial or is it for show? Is it shallow and for show or is it sacrificial? What is the motivation of the heart? Is it a selfless love for God and for others? Or is it a self-love? What's the motivation of the heart? Whether it's giving money or giving forgiveness or offering hospitality or serving the stranger. If it's done with the right heart and pure motivation, it's generosity in action. And sacrificial generosity is love in action. Here's the third ingredient to biblical generosity. Biblical generosity's purpose, the ultimate purpose of why we would be generous is to rescue, redeem, and restore people to God. I mean, what was the ultimate purpose of the Heavenly Father's sacrificial gift in John 3, 16? For this is how God loved the world he gave. What did he give? His one and only son. Why did he give it? So that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We were his motivation. His motivation was love for us. He gained nothing in that sacrificial gift but a relationship with us. The driving purpose and passion behind his act of sacrificial generosity was providing a way for sinful men and women to come into relationship with a holy God. And that happens through his son, Jesus. There are a lot of things in this world that you can be investing in. 
A lot of things that you can invest your time in, your talent in, your treasure in. But the question I would be asking, I believe the question God is asking, the question I'm asking of myself, the things I'm investing in, are they making an eternal difference in people's lives? Every, purpose, every person in this room, every person in the world for that matter, is going to stand before God someday. And I don't have time. Life is too short. And I don't have enough money to invest things that, in things that are not making an eternal difference in people's lives. The reality that some people are going to spend eternity with God and some people are going to spend eternity apart from God drives my passion for generosity. I want to do everything within my power to make sure as many people as can hears about the love and grace of God that has been offered to them. We should be a redeeming, restoring, rescuing people bringing people far from God into relationship with the Father. We should love what he loves, pursue what he pursues, and give ourselves selflessly the way he has. That is biblical generosity. Now listen, I believe this. I'm not just saying this. I believe that the Christian people should be the most generous people on planet Earth. Why? Because of what we believe. We believe in grace. You can't believe in grace. And even more, you can't have received grace and not be motivated to share it and give it away. If you're stingy or bitter or cynical and you live life with the clenched fist, I would have an honest conversation with you about your encounter with God. Because you cannot have a genuine encounter with grace and be humbled by God's grace and not be so overwhelmed you figure out, God, what can I do with my life to honor you for the undeserved grace in my life? I deserve nothing from God except possibly His judgment. I have failed him so many times, no amount of work or confession or penance I could ever pay would elevate me to right standing before God. And the reality is, all of us are in the same boat. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Did you hear that word justified freely? The word justified is a courtroom term. It's justification. When, 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 when Paul says we have been justified by grace that was given to us through redemption in Christ Jesus, it means that we stand before the Father, the judge, and the Father looks at us. We have now been acquitted. Our debt has now been paid. We have now been justified. There is not one blemish, not one check mark on our sinful list that is noticeable by God because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has covered us, and it was justification given to us freely. It was costly to him and free to us. Grace is defined as special favor, disposition to or an act of courtesy, kindness, or clemency. You, it, 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 no matter how you look at grace, it's unearned, it's undeserved, it's unmerited. Free to us, costly to him. I recently had a conversation with a man He's been out of church most of his adult life. He's made North Place his home over the last couple years. He was a rough kid growing up, had a rough past. And he said, I've not, I'm, I'm not been in church most of my adult life because of the judgmental environment I grew up in church. And, and I know I could never go back to the church I grew up in because my adult life got worse than the teenage life that caused that church to be judgmental towards me. He said, I really didn't think I would ever find a church that I could come to because of my past until I found North Place. Why do people like that guy find home here? People like him, a lot of people like him. Because it's a grace-based environment and a grace-based environment can only happen in a culture of generosity. 
A culture where people understand that all of us, beginning with this pastor, have received the unmerited and undeserved grace of God. We are not a perfect people building a social club. We are wounded healers, broken people, being restored by the grace of God. And we are simply on a journey, inviting other people on a journey of restoration. And God's grace is restoring us. I get that. And I think there's a lot of people in our church that get that. We have been given something we don't deserve and we freely offer it to people who don't deserve it right along with us. So there are some rough characters that can find a home here because every one of us are our own rough character in our own way and yet the grace of God is powerful enough to meet every one of us where we are. Not a one of us deserve it. Every time I walk through the hallway from the offices to come in here to preach, there is this one thing in my mind that I'm saying to myself on the way to this platform. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where they can find bread. I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where they can find bread. It's one desperate life in need of grace telling other desperate lives that there is grace and it is available today. And if you have received it and have been marked by it, When a person recognizes how powerful grace is and how much has been extended to them by God and by people, the only logical result is a deep sense of gratitude. You are humbled by it. Listen to Paul in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You know what Paul says? Once you've viewed God's mercy, once you've seen his grace, once you've caught a glimpse of what it costs God to come to you, the only logical response for you is to give him your whole life, to lay your whole life on the altar and say, here I am, God. He doesn't want part of you. He doesn't want more of you. He wants all of you. And the only logical response when you have been fully aware of the grace of God is to say, I'm all in. I am your currency. Spend me however you please. Here's what happens. When you've been marked by grace, gratitude looks back on the grace of God and says, how can I repay you? How can I ever repay you? And then you start thinking about it and you realize There's nothing I could ever do that would be adequate enough to pay God back for the costly gift of grace he's given me. So what is somebody that's truly been humbled by grace supposed to do? Grace has made us grateful. What do we do? A people who truly understands God's grace will be grateful people. And grateful people give. Grateful people serve. Grateful people offer hospitality. Grateful people are generous people. Listen to this. A grace-filled culture is a grateful culture is a generous culture. A a grace-filled culture is a grateful culture is a generous culture. Grace births gratitude and gratitude births generosity. That's why Paul says, in view of God's mercy, the only logical response is for you to give your whole self back to God. As an act of worship. The more you understand how spiritually destitute you really were or you really are, the more you understand how far God had to go to reach you, the more you fully grasp the measures he had to go through to bring you into relationship with him, the more generous you will be. That's why Christian people should be the most generous people on planet earth. A biblically selfless, sacrificial generosity. What is real Christian generosity? If we lived it, It would change the world. It already has at some places in history. And I leave you with this. Rodney Stark is a historian and a sociologist. And he had this probing question as a historian. How did Christianity as a religion go from the poor and destitute of the Roman Empire to basically taking over the Greco-Roman world in the early days of Christianity. How did it happen? How did a religion that was birthed among the poor and destitute literally spread like a virus throughout the Greco-Roman world? Nero was feeding Christians to lions in the Colosseum. He was taking other Christians, rolling them in tar, ramming them with stakes, and hanging them in streets, setting them on fire as torches in order to light the streets of Rome. 
How did this destitute bunch of downtrodden people ever get a foothold in the Greco-Roman world? Rodney Stark is a historian, and he wanted to answer that one simple question. And his whole book, The Rise of Christianity, is committed to answering that question. And he comes to this one conclusion in his book. It was an unbounded and radical generosity in the lives of early Christ followers that caused their faith to spread. The early believers had been marked with the same radical generosity that was modeled in the life of Jesus. They took Jesus at his word and began to actually live it out in their lives. So much so that in AD 360, a pagan and idol-worshiping Roman emperor, Julian, said this about Christian people. The impious Christians, that wasn't a compliment, The impious Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. This is a nervous emperor trying to stamp out Christianity. And he's saying, listen, these Christians, not only are they not being stopped, they are growing. And I'm nervous because not only are they caring for their own poor, they're caring for the poor of other religions in the empire that we as a wealthy state are not even caring for. Here is a pagan idol worshiping emperor saying the Roman empire was being changed in his mind in a negative way because of Christian generosity. Dionysus, who was the bishop of Alexandria about a hundred years before Julian was the emperor of Rome, wrote a certain statement about the church. It was a time when a plague or pandemic was sweeping major cities in the ancient world. There was no medicine and technology like we have to do today, an awareness of how to deal with those things, so thousands of people were dying. It would be very much like the Ebola outbreak. People that go to serve those that are infected are much in danger. They're risking their lives to serve them. It was much the same case, but at a greater level of danger. Dionysus said this, somewhere around AD 250. During these times, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. In other words, knowing they could die, they cared for the sick anyway, and some of the sick they cared for lived while the caregivers died from the very disease they were serving. The unbelievers behaved in the very opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, from their own family, throwing them into the roads before they were dead. My prayer today is that the culture of this church would mature even beyond what it is and that our lives would be marked by the same kind of selfless, God-honoring generosity. A generosity that expresses love, the same generosity you see in John 3.16. A generosity that expresses love, a generosity that is sacrificial, a generosity that is driven to rescue, redeem, and restore broken people into relationship with God. And may it not just be something we do or practice, but may it truly be our nature, our DNA. May it be a reflection of who we are. Hear the same worn out verse in a fresh new way. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. So everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. I received an email just a few days ago from a gentleman that attends our church who works for a multinational global company that bases out of the DFW area. He said this to me. He said, Pastor, you're always commenting about the generosity and the culture of the North Place And I wanted to share something with you. I'm working in contract with a very large global company based in the DFW area. And for the month of August, they've had a global commitment to collect school supplies for a poor neighborhood elementary school that is under the shadow of their corporate headquarters. For the entire month, they've collected $215 and one box of school supplies. There are over 1,000 employees at this location alone, and this is a 
a, a large initiative corporate-wide. He said, it makes me extremely proud to be a part of North Place and knowing we are a generous people who are reaching people. And I would say, James, me too. Me too. But we can always grow. We can always be more like Jesus. More surrendered to him, giving our lives more to him. He doesn't want more of you. He wants all of you. And today, whether you're kind of seeking this thing out, trying to make decisions about faith, maybe you take the first baby step. For some of us that have been in this thing for 40 years, maybe you take the next step. Whatever it looks like to go deeper in your faith. Take a step of surrender today and let his grace mark your life. This is what I want us to do today. I uh, I want us to pray. I'm going to have, in a moment we're going to stand, I'm going to have our team come and gather at the front of this building in a culture of grace. We believe God can give us the gift of grace to move mountains. We've been praying for God to move the mountain of a pastor named Scott that I know, brain tumor, uh, surgery he just had. We've been praying for God to to remove the mountain of cancer in the life of an 18-year-old girl named Lauren that's a part of our youth leadership team here at North Place. The new one I mentioned to you today, Amy, fighting for her life. I see you a surgery gone south. And the desperate needs I mentioned, there are so many of them in this room. I don't know your names. I don't know the needs. I don't know what's touching your life. But we're gonna we're gonna bring our team forward today to pray for you that God's grace would be a gift to you, it would be manifested in those situations in your life. That he would show himself. I want us to pray that way today before we leave. So would you stand with me all over this place to give our prayer team an opportunity to slide to the aisle and to make their way here. I'm going to pray over you today. There's going to be a lot of needs we pray for today. I know that Lauren's dad and brother are in service with us today and specifically ask And I'm going to be joining for them in prayer. Uh, Mom is in the hospital, maybe even watching service today. Just, and and we all we all have our own battles. And today, I just, I just want you to know we're ready to stand with you and pray that the grace of God would manifest itself in your life. And maybe that grace is just like, Pastor, I need to give my life to Jesus today. I've been running 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. And today, I need to give my life to Jesus. It's the greatest miracle that would ever happen. is a miracle of you being rescued into the arms of God. So before I open these altars, let me pray for you. Jesus, would you transform our lives? Grow us into becoming a culture that is even more generous than we've ever been in the past. Because we've been more marked by your grace. Forgiving and loving and serving, showing hospitality. And giving and going and doing. Father, I pray you'll bless them and keep them. I pray you'll make your face shine down upon them. That you will be gracious to them. Show them more grace. Turn your countenance their direction today, Father, and grant them peace. Make us a generous people and meet us at this altar today. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open today. If you just need to be there in a moment of surrender, you're welcome to stay in this worshipful environment. God bless you.